Dear friends, uh, I'm not going to make it a lecture-based program as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there's a very useful note on cross-examination which I'm sure all of you have seen. Mr. Jain has spoken eloquently about how to conduct a cross-examination. But no talk about cross-examination would be complete unless we talk about examination in chief. Today, you have the facility of preparing an academic sitting in your chamber which is a copy-paste of plate, which is wrong, if I may tell you. You can't do it because many judges have started rejecting it also. So it's important for us to know what is an examination in chief and how to go about it. I'm sure many of you have done it, but many of you are yet to do it in real life. Now, examination in chief is really, as was explained, there are relevant facts, there are facts in issue. So what you do when you are doing an examination in chief? You are examining your own witness and you are eliciting from your own witness a story which the judge, when he's wanting to write the judgment, can read coherently and find out as to what has happened. In a civil case, for instance, whether there was really a consensus ad item between the parties, what were the terms, or whether the contract is vitiated by fraud, undue influence, misrepresentation, whatever. I'm just giving you examples. So it's very important that the examination in chief is done in such a manner that a coherent story comes out. Now, I'm sure all of you have read novels at some point of time in life. When you read a novel, you realize that novel has several chapters. So you read chapter one, the story will end there. Then you have the chapter two, then you have chapter three, until the end. Your examination in chief should also be like a novel. You should focus on one area, finish that area, move on to the next area, and the third area, and the fourth area, and so on, till you reach the end. Now, how do you do a cross uh, an examination in chief? You have been told you can't ask leading questions, you have to make a story which reads, etc. So it is very important for us to know how do we frame questions in examination in chief. You know, I'm sure you know it, but there is a certain formula which we apply. For instance, if I were to ask you, sir, what is the color of your shirt? What would be your answer? Right. So I asked a question which was a non-leading question because it did not have an answer in it. I wanted to know from him what is the color of his shirt. So my question began with a what. So when you put a what, when you put where, when you put how, when you put who, these questions become non-leading questions and you get the story from the witness mouth. Right? It's very important to remember that you should not mix up multiple questions into one question. You should elicit one fact at a time. That's very important. Otherwise, you will lose track. The witness will lose track. Possibly, you have done very good preparation. You know the story. But think of the witness. He's your own witness. He may not remember the story the way you want it to come out. So it's very important for us to ask one fact at a time when we are asking questions. So I gave you a very useful tip. When you use what, where, how, when, describe, etc. At the beginning of your question as a prefix, you ask a question which is a non-leading question. Now I'll move on to the cross-examination. It's very important for us to know why do we do cross-examination. Cross-examination, at times what happens is a witness who is the opponent's witness whom you are going to cross-examine has elicit, has spoken half truth. He has given some information but not given complete information. There is a suppression which you know that there is a suppression. Now therefore it's your skill, it's your art that brings out what the suppressed material from the witness. So that's one purpose that you extract favorable admissions from the witness whom you are cross-examining. The other most important aspect of cross-examination is that you discredit this witness. The witness is lying he, or he does not know what he is talking about. It's very important because once you are able to impeach the credit of the witness, his testimony is disbelieved by the court. It goes out of the window. You succeed. So these are the two very important reasons why we do cross-examination. Now let me tell you, all of you have seen a bayonet, you know, a rifle with a... Um, uh, yes, Sangeen, absolutely yes. Now, with a bayonet, if you have in hand, you can virtually kill anyone, except sit on it. So cross-examination is like a bayonet. It's in your hand. It's a very important weapon and tool in your hand. You can virtually kill the opponent. 
except sit on it. And as my learned friends explained, you know, you should know when to stop. You should know what not to ask. You should know what to ask, etc. All that is very important. Some useful tips I would like to give you as far as cross-examination is concerned. In order that the witness remains confined and closed in his response to your questions, <coughs> your questions, if they are closed questions, if they are leading questions, witness will only say yes or no, depending upon what you want the witness to say. Color of your shirt is white, isn't it? How would you respond? Yes. Yes. So you've only got one answer, yes. It was a leading question. It was a closed question. It was a, what is a leading question? Leading question is a question which suggests an answer. A non-leading question is a question which does not suggest an answer, which elicits a, a, a response or a statement from the witness. What is the color of your shirt? I don't know. I mean, the lawyer does not know. Witness has to speak because witness is spelling out the story. But in a cross-examination, when you want to confine the witness, one of the techniques which is used very effectively and very efficiently is you ask leading questions, you ask closed questions, you ask questions which suggest an answer. That's extremely important because if you ask a non-leading question or an open question, possibly <coughs> that might give the witness a room to escape, which you may not want. Of course, there could be situations when you have to ask a non-leading question <coughs> to elicit something out of the witness. But that's a skill that you develop over the years once you start cross-examining witnesses. So that's one area which is very important that you have to contain the witness by asking questions which are closed questions. The questions should be short and direct. You've seen sometimes, all of us have witnessed sometimes, the questions are very complex very complex. When you went there and you saw the car running and the car was honking and the um, uh, car was being driven rashly and negligently, what was the time of the day? Now, all the prefix is irrelevant. So cut it out. Questions should be short. Also, as this note says, once you have got an important and favorable admission, do not ask the witness to explain because witness will realize possibly his folly or his mistake and will try to qualify that statement, will try to improve upon it. So it's very important for you to know when to stop. Now, no case is complete, no case can be fought successfully unless you are prepared well. So it's very important that you prepare well for your case. I'm, re I'm reiterating it because we have seen many times, you know, we start reading the brief, some, some people start reading the brief only early mornings and uh, they haven't made their notes. So, it's important. The preparation for cross-examination particularly is very important. And for a good preparation, it's very important that you know what is the case of the opposite side, what is your case. What is the case that has been built up? What are the facts and issues as was pointed out? It's very important for you to know. You cannot go on aimlessly in cross-examination. It is very dangerous sometimes to ask questions in cross-examination of which you don't know the answers because you don't know what way the witness will go. So be very careful before putting such questions where you are not sure of the answers. Of course, a skillful cross-examiner may at times take a chance and turn around the witness, but that's after you have acquired sufficient skills and you can then mold your questions accordingly. Sometimes we find that witness in his plaint had said, well, the contract, you know, was not entered into and now in the cross, in the examination in chief or in cross-examination, he has given some suggestion or some answer which is contrary to his previous statement. Now, how do we deal with a situation like this? That's very important and we see it many times when we are able to successfully extract from the witness a contradiction from something which he has said in a document earlier or in a pleading earlier. Now there is a principle that we, we can follow. It's a principle of four C's. C, C, C and C. First C is credit. 
credit is you would show to the witness the previous statement that he made and say, do you remember this document or show the document or show the pleading or the portion? This was made by you. This was signed by you. So you commit him, that's the second C, commit him to that statement. Then you contrast him with what he has said now, you know, five minutes ago or ten minutes ago in the cross-examination. Contrast it. But now look at your testimony, dated so-and-so or made a little while ago. Identify the portion. You have said so-and-so. Contrast. And then confront the fourth C. Confront him that you have made contradictory statements to mislead the court. He will say no, but you have done your job. You have impeached his credit. You have shown to the judge, because when the judge is reading his statement, his testimony in the chamber while writing a judgment, he will know that yes, this witness has made contradictory statement. He's not worthy of any credit. Although the witness will say, no, no, both statements are correct. But you don't have to fight or quibble with the witness at that point of time. You just need to accept it, let the answer come. The judge will have to decide whether the witness has really spoken the truth or not.